Praise the Lord, everybody. Isn't God good? What a wonderful opportunity we have again this morning, huh? To come to gather around the name of Jesus. We get so used to doing what we're doing here, come to church every week and whatever, you know, we sometimes need to stop and remember exactly what we're doing because we get used to it. We take it for granted a little bit. But I mean, just a wonderful time to be alive today. We're coming to you from the States, obviously, but really you don't need us to come over here. You guys have everything you need right here, don't you? You really do. You don't need an American to come over and teach the Bible to you. You guys you know, have been coming over to the States for, for many years now, teaching it to us, preaching the gospel. So we're, we're really, we're, we're happy to be here. We're, we feel connected. We feel like, um, I feel this way. I know my wife does too. That You know, Australia is the only other country in the world that's so much like home. When we come here, we don't feel like we're in another country. We feel like we're at home. And uh, some, sometimes the Aussies think that I'm just saying that. You know, I had my son-in-law, Aaron, he thought I was just kind of saying that the other day. I said, no, not at all. I said, you know, the guy I saw fishing down on the dock down here, off the, I said, that's just like in Missouri where I grew up, you know, around Huck Finn and Tom Sawyer and those guys. We're very, very, very similar people. We fish just the same way. We act the same way. So anyway, uh, I know you guys are a bit more European and whatever than we are, but we're not going to hold that against you. <laughs> I'm only kidding. But we just love being here. And I tell you, man, this is such an amazing, amazing moment in history to be alive. And uh, from our perspective over in the States, I mean, the last two years have just been some of the best entertainment of my entire life, have taken place on television and through the election that we had and things like that. And it's not that it's not serious. It's very, very serious. But just some of the most amazing things have happened that, that nobody foresaw. We didn't see things happening. You know, the, the world's been getting darker, hasn't it, for the last, well, many, many, many years throughout my entire lifetime. The world's getting a little bit darker and a little bit darker and a little bit darker, just as the Bible said it would. So again, it's easy to just kind of get involved in getting used to things are going a certain way and then forgetting that, hey, we serve a great God. You know, just like I was saying about you can come to church and come to church and slowly forget how great God is. Because we're used to God. It doesn't mean that, you know, that we meant to do it. It just happens because we're human. It's psychological, really. But at the same time in the States, you know, we've just had this amazing opportunity to see that, you know, God is amazing. God actually answers prayer still. And when it, just when it looks like the most demonic kind of rulers are going to rise up and win elections and take over, then it just didn't quite happen that way in the States this time. And it's not that, it's one political party or persuasion over the other. It's not that at all. It's not that you have to wave a certain flag or whatever, but from our perspective in the States, it's been amazing to see that, you know, there still is a remnant of the people of God that were just tired, tired of going a certain way, tired of seeing Christians crucified to their homes in the Middle East. We just got tired of that. Anybody here feel like me? I get a little riled up. I get so tired of the church in America being so used to just doing what it always does. And it's almost like we don't even read the headlines. We don't even realize that somebody has to rise up. Somebody has to take hold of God. God has made all these amazing promises. God sent his only son. I mean, our brother here just outlined what Jesus did for us. We can't just take that for granted. And I was so glad to see in the last two years that there was a remnant of people, not only in the, in the United States, but around the world and in Australia and places like that, that just said, God, God, come down. God, move close. God, swing low. Jesus, we need you. Stem the tide. Do something different. And so I realize, I realize it's still we're still living in the world. You know, the millennium's not here yet. Not everything changed. Things are still going the same way. The, Satan is still the God, little G of this world, isn't he? I mean, after all, he offered Jesus the kingdoms of the world, didn't he, at the temptation? You know, come and worship me and bow down, Jesus, and all these things will be yours. But you know, Jesus was, he wasn't going to be tempted by that, was he? Why? Because he was a part of a much greater kingdom than that. He's like, are you kidding me? I walk with God. I am the son of God. 
That does not tempt me. We just It's been good to get a glimpse of the body of Christ, the remnant, not the whole church system. The whole church system seems to me today like it really, it's going to hell. We gasp a little bit when we say that, but it does us good to say these things sometimes and, and to just step back from the woods or the forest and take a look and see, okay, what kind of trees we have here? I'm making sense to anybody today. This is just my introduction to let you know how glad I am to be here. <laughs> I, I'm so glad that there are real believers today. You know, I was, I was starting to lose my own faith a little bit and just being in the ministry for all these years that, you know, just, can we make a difference in this world? And so today, you know, it's, again, we've got a long ways to go. It's not to say that we've won most of the battles. We haven't, but we made a little bit of an inroad. The church woke up just a little bit and said, you know what? This thing's real. Jesus is real. God is real. We, we don't have, we're, we, we don't, we're not from here. We're pilgrims moving through here. We're just passing through. But we're the light. We're the salt. We're supposed to leave something here as we go through. Amen. And that's the reason I say what a great opportunity that we have. Not only can we awaken and, and shake ourselves, but we can look and see what's going on around us and we can realize this truly is a day when God is doing something fresh. God is doing something new. And I'm just so happy to be a part of it. We should come to church every time that we gather and we should really believe the words of these songs that we sing. We should really believe that, you know, the church, that's the thing on this planet in God's mind. Last week, I, we started to talk about the lost city of God. I don't know some of you might remember that if you were here. The lost city of God. That's going to be my message again today and, and next week. But we're going to look at different aspects of it. But one thing I said to you uh, uh, last week, and really what this message is about, is recovering the ruins of authentic Christianity. You know, coming, if you haven't quite come to the realization I just described, I want you to come to it. I want you to realize God is an ever-present help in your time of need. God is right there, you know, even if it seems like he's not answering prayer, even if it seems like we're going the wrong direction, even if it seems like you're stuck in your spiritual life, God is right there. And it, it's not that big of a deal to get out. It's not that big of a deal to get unstuck. And so last week I said this, part of, I didn't really go into it, but I want to go into it a little bit today, part of unsticking and part of recovering what has been lost in the church is coming back to an understanding of what the, the, the greatest kind of anointing is. I know Pastor Neil here, he talks about the anointing a lot. And I love that about him. It gets me fired up and charged up. When I'm around him, I actually, I actually get something, you know, a little piece of his anointing that God gave him rubs off on me. And I'm guessing that's the way most of us feel here. So we have that in common. But, you know, he loves the anointing. I also love the anointing. He loves what we call revival. He was sharing with me a book about the Azusa Street Revival. We were talking about some of those things. He has a heart for revival. Man, I have a heart for revival. What's that mean? Seeing God revive His people. Seeing God stir us up, you know? And so, so but I realize a lot because I travel and I have a, a, a local church too, so, you know, all of us are the same. I realize that we lose track of what it is that God's doing most. There's so many subjects to cover in the Bible and so many things experiences that we've had and things that we know. We sometimes lose track, though, of what it is God's doing most. We can, we can get all caught up in, Neil Myers came to my church and the anointing came. And we got stirred up and we got excited. We got a touch from God. We, we had a heart for souls again. We had a heart for the church to, to really be an exciting place to be again. And we, we got a, a bit of a heart for people in the church to find out what it is that God wants them to do and has called them to do and, and to help start having that happen again. And then a different kind of guy might come along. Maybe a prophet comes to your church and a little bit different kind of anointing comes in. And God comes and says, hey, but we want to talk about the condition of your heart. I want to look closely. I want to walk closely with you, right? Or we might have an evangelist that come and stirs us up, you know, to win souls. Or a teacher come and instruct us on many things. There are many anointings. Somebody say anointing. There are many kinds of anointing in the Word of God. But the most important kind is the one that we cannot lose touch with. The most important anointing in the Bible rests not on me or you. It rests on we. The most amazing stories that we know from the book of Acts, right? They didn't happen like in the Old Testament. It happened a little bit more in the Old Testament. There was a Moses. There was an Elijah. There was a David. 
the, the, the individual anointing is important, but in the New Testament, it shifts a little bit and it becomes what God's doing through all of us. We got a glimpse of it in the Old Testament because God was working with the nation of Israel. And so they, as a people group, were anointed, weren't they? They were touched by God. That's what the word anointing means. They were, they were touched. You know, they were oiled. How many people have ever anointed someone with oil? What happens there? You know, you get it on you and they get it on them. And something kind of dirty and weird, you know, greasy. And you know what I mean? It's not the most comfortable thing. But that's exactly what God's like. You get around him and he gets around you. You draw near to him. He draws near to you. He sent his son to the earth. So at any moment then we can step into that, what he's done. And not just, not just walk in our own anointings, but walk in that corporate anointing that he gave us to be his body. It's a little bit different thing now. So let me tell you, every time we get together, it's an exciting time, whether we know it or not. Because every single time we get together, it's a time to touch God, for God to touch us. I often tell my church back home this. I said, never forget this. You might want to take some notes today. I'll say some things that'll resonate. You know, it'll be God saying them, not because I'm special, just because that's the way he uses me. But I always say to my church back home, never forget this. There are two things, right? As a Christian, you can't ever forget. Number one, God can touch you. Everybody's like, duh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, God can touch you. But if God doesn't touch you, then number two, you can touch God. I love that. When God touches you, we call that anointing. When God's not seemingly, you know, just around in a real tangible way, then we can still touch him. We're not forsaken. He never leaves us alone. That's called faith. We say, God, remember the last time you touched me? That was awesome, man. Remember when I got saved? If I can't remember anything else, I remember when I got saved. When I got saved, there's nobody there. It was just me and the preacher on TV, but then God came. There was nobody else in the room. It was just me, Charles Stanley preaching on television. And then all of a sudden, God filled the room. And the longest day I live, I'll never forget the presence of God. I didn't need somebody else to teach about it. I experienced it. Then I was able to go into the Bible and say, wow, that is what's supposed to happen. And I can remember from that time forward, if God doesn't do that again in my life, I can always touch Him. There are 10 cases in the Bible, you might remember, where Jesus was ministering, found in the four Gospels, where you know, there are many places where Jesus just came and touched people, and sometimes everybody was healed. The anointing of God on his life was an amazing thing, wasn't it? He fed 4,000, he fed 5,000, but did you ever notice that Jesus worked closely with the people? He didn't normally just do everything completely on his own. He got them working with him. He said, for example, with the feeding of the, of the four and 5,000, you know, what do we have at our disposal? What do we have that God can work with? Because God's not just a God that moves around touching people all the time. God works with people because God's interested in personal growth. He's interested in touching us, not so that we can just keep coming back to church every week and say, God, touch me again. God, touch me again. Because if we do that, we'll just stay babies our whole lives. And then pretty soon, you know what will happen? God won't be touching us anymore, but we'll still be pretending that he is. And then... People will come from the outside in and we'll tell them that God is here and they'll be like, but I don't sense it anywhere. And we get used to what we've been doing and if we're not careful, we end up thinking something's happening when something's not happening. So there's always two things. I'm always like, God, you do anything you want today. The Bible says that the gifts of the Spirit, they, they are freely given to us, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, but they work as God wills, as the Holy Spirit wills. You're glad you came to church this morning. When God begins to move, it's as He wills, as He wants to move. But if He's not moving, what do we do? We say, God, we still believe. We trust You. We put ourselves out there. God, do what You want to do. So this morning, I, I want to kind of just stir that up in you with the few minutes that we have. I want you to, to have a heart today to want to recover the most important things of God. Why don't you go in your Bible with me back to the Old Testament? Let me just get my... Stuff laid out here for the next, won't keep you here too long, maybe another 15 minutes or so. I want you to go in the Old Testament with me this week. I want you to go to Isaiah chapter 2, if you would. Notice what it says here. It's 
Isaiah chapter 2. It says, the word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in verse 1. Now this is a book of, obviously, experiences that the prophet Isaiah had. And so this is a specific one. And this word says, now it shall come to pass in the latter days. Somebody say latter days. I got a feeling that's the day we're living in today. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow to it. I'm looking forward to that time. Many people, many, many people shall say, or shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion, listen to verse, uh, the last part of verse 3, out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. We've all read that verse before. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Looking forward to that, aren't you? O house of Jacob, come and let us walk in the light of the Lord. And we can just we can just go on and on. You go to the next verse. It says, "Come and let us walk in the light of the Lord, house of Jacob. I'm going to build my kingdom on earth in the last days, and it's going to be, you know, in the it's going to be a mountain above all other mountains, and it's going to be from the city of Jerusalem that God's word is going to be going forth, and the light of the Lord is going forth." But notice verse six. It says, "For you have forsaken your people, the house of Jacob, because they're filled with eastern ways." We're not very familiar in the, in the Western world today with the Lord. We're not as familiar as we should be with Him. And one of the reasons is, is the same reason that, that Isaiah was addressing here. It's because we've accepted all the other religious ways of the world, especially those that come out of the East. Amen? But I just love the picture that's being drawn here. God says, listen, man, be done with all that. Be done with all the soothsaying, right? Be done with all the ways of you know, interchanging with silver and gold as he goes into in verse 7. Be, be done with all the ways that this world operates. Those ways are not pleasing to God. Come back to the Lord and let the Lord do what it is He wants to do. And Isaiah is seeing forward into the future saying, Hey Israel, this is the way it's going to be one day. And so you can see again in scriptures like this that there is a city of God in the works and the plans. God has prepared a city. Go back to Hebrews chapter 11. We left off there last week where God told Abraham that he prepared for him a city. There's something that God is doing that's much greater, much bigger than what we're involved with and the cities that we live in and maybe a part of building now. It's what God is doing, which is going to come to full fruition in the latter days, according to Isaiah. Hebrews chapter 11, we know this is the great heroes of faith chapter, don't we? Notice what it says, beginning in verse 11 again, it says, these all died in faith, and he's laying out, talking about the Enoch's, the Noah's. But they all died in faith, not having received the promises. They didn't receive the full promises of God. They walked in a portion of what God had called them to do, but they didn't get to walk in that fullness of the Lord. But having seen them afar off, they were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And if truly they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had an opportunity to return. So here, the writer of Hebrews is talking about how these men and women walked in faith. And particularly he's talking about Abraham and Sarah here, and he's saying, listen, these guys walked in faith by walking out of the world. They walked away from where it is that they called home. Are you here today? And because they walked away from what they were used to, what they had gotten used to, because they walked away from that, they were able to keep walking into what God had promised for them. In order to walk towards God, we have to keep walking by faith. In order to keep walking into what God has for us, in order to keep walking as the church into the place where every time we get together, God moves on us because that's His plan, we, we have to keep walking towards the Lord. But it said the only way these guys kept walking forward is by realizing that God was calling them somewhere better. And they didn't think, Abraham, for example, he did not think back that Babylon was a better place to live. 
Imagine how he could have thought that. Babylon was much more civilized, wasn't it? It was much more modern where Abraham came from. It had everything, but it had also all those trappings of those Eastern ways. And so God picked a man, knew his heart, called him out and said, I've got something else going on. In fact, it's going on for the whole world, but I'm going to use you, Abraham, to be a faithful follower so that I can make you a father of faith for everyone else to see. And so he started walking. And all these people were walking. But the key thing that Abraham or anyone else did is they looked away from where they came from. This is a day today, guys, to not look back. Don't look back today. Don't think back. Don't go back. Don't even go back to the highlights of the good things for very long. Don't go back and remember what God did in the 70s or the 80s or the 90s or whenever. Don't go back and dwell there because God always has something greater out ahead of you. Listen, when the band was playing today, you know, they were worshiping and they sounded so good and everything. You guys, man, you've really, really grown. And I'm like, wow, these guys sound great. But all of a sudden as I was listening and I was hearing past just the music and the instruments and the singing, all of a sudden I started to hear the sound of heaven in them. And you know, I got to tell you, Dave, the guitar player back there, I got to tell you, I started hearing the sound of heaven in your guitar this morning. And I want you to know, man, I got a word for you right now. I want you to know, you are called to be a shredder of heaven, my brother. You are called to shred that guitar for the Lord. And it's not in a carnal way, man. You could do it. You could do it because you've practiced. You, you've put in the hours. But God's calling you to something greater now. God's calling you to kind of that place where because you've put in the time, you can now kind of just step to the side and be freely used to do what you do. And you are a good example to all of us here, Dave. This is what God is calling us to. He's saying, listen, I've done many things in your life, but it's time now to step aside. Don't keep going back to what you used to do. Step aside and let me use you the way I want to use you. Because I'm going to tell you right now, you're more of a pro than you know. You know many, many things better than you maybe think you know them. We've got to realize that in this day, in this hour, there are many young people that are coming up in a society filled with Eastern ways, but they know nothing of the city of God. And they need people like me and you that have been walking with the Lord, some for a little time and some for a long time. They need people to come along and say, hey, it's this way. It's not out there. Don't worry about out there, right? Don't worry about those Eastern ways in the world out there. Come and follow me to a higher place, a higher mountain, a greater city. The kingdom of God awaits you. Listen, it's time Christians come back and start thinking like this again. You can't just sit around and be like, well, I got saved, you know, and I'm just hanging in there. I mean, we're a little bit of an older crowd now. We're all getting older, aren't we? It's not time to settle down, though. It's time to fire up. Fan that flame. Fan the flame. Come on, let me tell you, the Bible doesn't say old people retire and go away. Does it? Where does it say that? The Bible says when you start to get the silver hair, that means, hey, clue. Clue for you. You know something somebody else needs to know. You know how to walk with God. You know God has touched you, and you know how to touch God. You have to stay back here in this light Christian anointing. Step up to the greater things. We don't have to lay hands on each other all the time and get all excited and get goosebumps about trading a little oil with each other. Something much higher than that. Man, let's just come together and say, God, here we are again. <laughs> do what you do, God. And we say, yeah, but Pastor Rocky, I don't really know how to do that. Neither do I. Uh, many of us, most of us in this generation have not been this way before. You know, that's why I get around guys like Joe. When I come here, I don't just go, oh, I'm the preacher this week, so, you know, I don't need to get anything from him. I come here to get something. I get around Cyril. I want to get some of that loving anointing on his life. I get around Chris. I want to get some of that teaching anointing on his life. Hello? I could go right down the line. I'm telling you, there's many people here. I'm not looking at you like somebody I need to teach. I'm looking at you as somebody I just want to stir up that you would teach. You would move. You would stand. Listen, you would grow. Grow. We don't let our kids stay five all their whole life. 
If my kid, when my kid was five and they got the, you know, they, they could do certain things, but when they got the seven, I was like, stop being five. Yeah, but dad, I like to do that. And I like to do this. You know, maybe I like to play with toys that little babies play with. I'm like, time to put those toys away. Hey, get those toys out of their room. Give me that toy. You're not playing with that toy. Come on, time for you to grow up. You're growing and growing and growing. We're enjoying every stage, don't get me wrong, but it's time to grow. Let me tell you, there's a mountain growing in this earth that is called the, the body of Christ, the kingdom of God. It's a mountain that's rising up. It's not quite visible like Isaiah saw it yet, but it's rising up to that place. And one day, everybody on planet earth is going to want to go to that place. So what are we doing acting like they don't want to come now? Why do we stay down in these baby things? Because we get so distracted in the eastern ways of the world. Bobby and I love to come here. One of the things we're talking about, we love to come here because you guys are so laid back. We live in the Northeast. We live around New York City. Everything's like hyper stressful there. Everybody's like going, 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 but nobody knows where they're going. They don't know what they're doing. It's just like the church, though. Don't get me wrong. They think they do. Hello? They think they know. Let me tell you, if the church is ever going anywhere but straight towards God, it's going the wrong way. God's not interested in how well we sing, how great we preach, you know, how big our church is. He doesn't care about any of that. Stop trying to be something you're not. Hello? I know I can get a little cutting at times, but believe me, my heart's good. I'm just, I just want you to be right. I just want you to ha have your, you know, God's best. You know, so we run around New York all the time. We're going, we're going to be successful. This is the money center of the world. Make money. And the love of money is the root of all evil. If I stay around money too long, then I know you come to church and Christians say, yeah, but it's the love of money, brother. Let me tell you something. Most Christians can't handle money. And if you're telling baby Christians all the time to have a lot of money, you're sending them to hell. Oh, don't say things like that. That doesn't mean God doesn't want to provide. God doesn't want to pay your bills. But don't tell somebody. I never told my five-year-old that they could come outside and use the chainsaw with me. Hello? Listen, I'm just the kind of preacher. I'm a little bit prophetic. Some of these things are something that, some of the things that God's saying, not just to you as a local body, to us as the body of Christ. God's saying, come on, guys, today, grow. One of the things the Lord is saying right here this morning that I picked up, he was saying, don't hold back. Don't hold back. Don't stifle what God wants to do, right? I know you don't always know how to do it. Neither do I, but don't stifle it. Don't squash it. Don't stand on it, right? Don't get yourself in a, in a situation where you think, you know, you got, you, you're, you're, you know, people think you know, so you kind of got to keep pretending like you know. Did I come to the right church today? God's looking for a people that will say, Lord, we don't really know. And we're not embarrassed to say so. We don't really know, Lord. We haven't been this way before. We're like the Levites carrying the ark across the river Jordan. We're going to just go out that way. Remember we talked about that last week? We're going to go because you said to go, God. But we don't really know. But one thing I like is, boy, I, I like when we had that election in the USA last year. And all of a sudden, when the new guy came in, they stopped killing Christians. I did like that. So many Christians tell me back in America, oh, I don't know about so-and-so, the president. I said, I'm, I'm glad they're not crucifying Christians on their houses anymore. Not that nobody is, but not in the way that they were. Hello? You see, somebody somewhere, and God can use all kinds of people. He doesn't just use the people we think he should use. He can use all kinds of people. So sometimes God says, I'm tired of that. I'm tired of this being alive. And you know, we, we don't need a president or a premier or a prime minister or whatever you guys call it. We don't need that guy really to stop everything because the Bible says the church is the great restrainer in the earth. Because they're filled with the Holy Spirit, there's this massive movement that even the world, even the devil, the God of this world is trying to do something, but he can't do it. He can only do so much. Why? Because we're here. <laughs> and sometimes I look at us and I'm like, oh my God. I mean, we look so, so just disorganized. I mean, I never would have believed that we could have voted out Hillary. I became a believer again in the election. I didn't care who was running against her. She cannot be president. Because if she is, she stands for everything we're not. Hello? 
And even in America, Christians are going, well, I don't know. What? You don't know what? What rock have you been hiding under? You don't know because you watch too much TV. You read the newspaper. You, you believe everything this world and its Eastern ways keep telling you, stop. You should be reading the Bible. You should be fellowshipping with one another. The good news should be the first thing on our lips, right? Not the morning paper. That's how we've gotten into the condition where we're not sure who we are anymore. But let me tell you this morning, God is quite sure who we are. And God is quite willing to continue to build this mountain. And we're just living in such a great time. Why wouldn't we want to just be a part of what God's doing? But we've got to shake ourselves a little bit. Your brother, we have to remember what Jesus did for us. It's great to paint a picture like that. I love that. I love when somebody stands up and doesn't hold back and just gives it to me and I get it now because he was dramatic. Hello? Because he put himself into it. He didn't just go open your Bible. Right? We need to, today God is calling us to, to another level. It's time that we, we're archaeologists. We, we get out our tools, our brushes. We, we go to the, the desert and deserted areas, right? Where the devil doesn't want us to go. He doesn't want us to go back and explore. He, he wants us to talk about the fun things that we like, but he doesn't want us to brush the dirt off and find out why that happens like that. Whoa. Christians, when they find out, listen, that God moves wherever the body of Christ gets together. That's a huge, deep truth. Nobody, God's not looking for everybody to be perfect. We don't all have to have a special anointing that we can market and advertise. The world doesn't care. They do it better than we do it. You know, one of the things I heard Trump say, I don't, I don't have a direct quote, so I can't say for sure, but I like, I like this, and if it's not true, it makes a good story anyway. But you notice all the Christians got around him right away. You know what I mean? And some of those people are around him for good, and some of those people are around him because they want to be somebody. We're very aware of that in the U.S. But um, one of the things Trump said as he was first, before he won the election, before he was gathering, the Christians were gathering around him, he talked to him. I heard that he said, one of the preachers said that he said to them, how did you guys let this happen? And I thought, man, he's the guy right now. When I heard that, I was like, he's the only guy in all these people that are running that understands. I, he's not even saved. Maybe he's saved now. I don't know. But I mean, this guy's not even saved. But for some, in some way or for some reason, he understands the church is what has allowed this to happen. Not through religion, just through presence. We sometimes, we sing these songs, like, God, we love your presence. And God's like, okay, you are my presence. <laughs> Not, not in one sense, you know what I'm saying? I mean, we're not God, but in another sense, we're his body. So wherever we're at, he's there. The Bible says in Ephesians 1, God is filling all things everywhere through his body. I mean, that's true. I'm sorry, I get wound up. It's just the way it is. This is true. Wherever you and me go, and listen, it doesn't take 30 or 40 or 3,000 or 4,000. It only takes two or three. So there's never a time in this world where the church can't make a difference. But the church can only make a difference on the highest level when the church says, I'm not going to do it myself, and you can't do it yourself. We have to do it together. And it doesn't matter what our background is. This is Bible. Whoever doesn't do this going forward, they're going to become inconsequential. Whoever gets this, not just this message, I'm just saying God is recovering a lot of things. He's blowing the dust off a lot of things. But this is the base message of the church, the day of Pentecost, when it fully came, what happened? A wind, a sound came. They heard it in the distance, a roaring, mighty wind. We love that part, right? But it came in, and what happened? It not only filled them, it filled the house, the Bible says, where they were sitting. But it didn't just happen for no reason. It happened because Jesus said, tarry you in the city of Jerusalem until you're clothed with power from on high. Wait right here until God does what he wants to do. And they waited. They prayed. They stayed in the upper room. They hung out. And sooner or later, because they just stayed together, God did what he did. There's a real clue found in Acts chapter 2, and that's this. God does things on his calendar, on his timetable, not on ours. 
I believe there's a lot of things that we miss today because we're like, God, you know, we want you to do it here. We want you to do it this way. We want you to do it, you know, the way that we are more comfortable with. And God's like, I do it my way. You either join me in my way or you're on your own. <laughs> I love you. But if you're in the army of God, we're marching this way. We're not preaching another gospel. We have to stick to the original gospel. We can't follow another Jesus. It's the Jesus. Yeshua, Hamashiach. We follow the real, the authentic. Amen? God's way on God's timetable. And today is a great timing of God. We've stepped into a place where we must know this now so that we can go. But the great truth is it only takes two or three. I love that. It just takes me and Bobby. If nobody else cares, me and Bobby are going to get something done. <laughs> I don't know how much or what, but God's going to do something because we're going together. Amen? The Bible says this is the whole concept in the New Testament. So, so you move a little bit forward, you know, a little bit further in the book of Acts, and Peter and John are arrested, and they find themselves in trouble, and, you know, God does a miraculous thing, moves for them, and they get out, and they come back to the group, and they tell them what happened, and what happens immediately with the group? Did they have a party and say, let's sing 10 songs? No, they lifted their voice to God together in prayer and said, God, you are amazing, God. Your word is true. What you predetermined, what you said, the boundaries that you set before the foundation of the world, let those things happen. I love this stuff. We're not on our own here. They never thought they were on their own. They were walking with God. God had them in a timetable. God had them on a path. They were going in a direction. They could not fail. Five times in the New Testament, use the word predestination. Wars have been fought over what that means. It simply means this. God set the boundaries in advance. If you go with God, you can never end up losing out. If you, if you walk with God, and he'll let you go to this side and this side because he knows we're human. We make mistakes. We get dizzy. We, you know, we, 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 we don't always know what's going on. God works with us, but he's already predetermined. He's like, man, I've set the boundaries for you. You can't fail. But if we decide to go our own way, that's when we get in trouble. And the church today is so much like maybe Donald Trump said. It's so much like... We're sitting out waiting for something to happen, but you are what happens. I am what happens. It's time to stand up and learn a lesson from the days that we're living in and say, man, let's just be counted today. Let's just go forward with God and do what God wants to do. Hallelujah. You remember this scripture? I'll close with it. Revelation chapter 12. I'm sorry, chapter 3. Are you glad you came to church this morning? It says in Revelation chapter 3, of course, to the church, writing the letters to the churches. This is to the church of Philadelphia, which was, you know, the, the, the shining example of, you know, a great church, at least among those seven. And Jesus says in verse 12, Behold, I'm coming quick, or verse 11, Behold, I'm coming quickly. Hold fast that you have. Somebody say, Hold fast. Come on, guys, hold fast. Don't let go, don't go back. Hold fast on what you already have, that no one may take your crown. So you've already been given a reward in advance. Don't anybody take it away from you. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. And of course, I always love this verbiage in, in the first three chapters of Revelation. It says, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Most important sermons that are being preached today are the ones that the Spirit of God are breathing, is breathing. The Bible says here, you will be made a pillar in the temple of God. If you overcome, if you stand in there, hang on. I was telling somebody the other day, I said, you know, Christians today don't stand enough. We're, we're always trying to go to something that someone else painted a picture of, but Christians need to stand first and foremost. Have on the full armor of God, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, right? And make your stand. God will make the motion and the commotion around you. You make your stand. Me and you together standing. It changed some of the darkest pagan cities of the early biblical world. The Roman world, amen? Ephesus, Corinth. Thessalonica, 
These cities were deep and steeped in pagan Eastern rituals. And Paul came in there with the gospel and other men, his entourage, people traveling with him, and they preached the gospel and it sounded foolish, really. The men at Athens thought it was foolish. But even there, a few of them said, but wait a minute, maybe. And wherever that message was accepted, the whole atmosphere changed. The Bible says this is what we're headed for, pillars in the temple of God. Even to the church of Laodicea just after that. The promise is if you guys overcome, God will sit you down in His throne with Him. I mean, amazing. The worst church there was. Verse 21, whoever overcomes, I will grant to sit with me in my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my Father on His throne. Jesus said, I'm going to make you just like me. Even if you're the worst Christian, even if you're at the worst church, even if you've had the worst past, Jesus said, i still got a great promise for you. Come, follow me. So, word today, this morning. Global Connections Church, come and follow Him. The church today knows a lot about a lot of things. It's almost that we're overtaught. We know a lot about the Father. We know a lot about the Son. We know a lot about the Holy Spirit. But one thing I want to leave you with and challenge you with, and go, go read this this week and see what the Lord shows you. But Galatians chapter 4, verse 26, Paul said, do you know anything about your mama? I like to preach a sermon called, Who's Your Mama? There is a mother illustration in the New Testament for the body of Christ. And the mother is the... Paul says this way, the mother is Jerusalem which is from above. The great city of God. It's God's kingdom working from a higher dimension, but because of Christ, He's made us interdimensional. We're actually moving. We're we're here in Kiwana right now, but we're actually in the kingdom of God, aren't we? We're, We're here, but we're only pilgrims here. We're actually, our citizenship is from the new Jerusalem. It hasn't fully risen up or fully come down yet as it will, but we're citizens there and we operate from there. We have visas and passports from there. We can do things here people don't think we can do. People look at us and say, what do you have to offer? But we have all the backing of heaven because we are seated with Christ in heavenly places, in spiritual places. Get away from all the babyhood milk teaching that has maybe kept you stuck where you are and say, God, begin to feed me your way until I come back to a real awareness and a realization of who I really am in you and what we're really doing here as the body of Christ. If we can do that, we will not be like the nation of Israel in Jesus' day. Jesus, on His way to the cross, stops, overlooks the city of Jerusalem, remember? And He said, how many times would I have gathered you? But you would not. Like a a mother hen gathers the little chicks under her wing. I've had chickens. I know exactly how this goes. But God's very shepherding, isn't He? He's the great shepherd. And He said, I would have gathered you. I wanted to gather you. But you would not. You missed the hour, the time, the moment of your visitation because you were so involved in distracted by everything else. This is not a day, guys, let me tell you right now, to to only be able to listen to a preacher for 20 minutes. Get away from that kind of stuff. Come to the foot of the Lord and be like Martha. If you have to sit there all day, man, until you really begin to hear from God, that's what's most important. Come and follow the Lord. It's not about time or not time. It's about heart. Does your heart belong to the Lord? Let's bow our heads. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for this group of people that you strategically placed here in this town. Father, in this hour, in such a time as this, God, we ask this morning for a revelation of the things that we've just peeked into in the Bible. Lord, we don't understand very much of these things at all. We see through a glass darkly, but Lord, give us wisdom. Give us understanding. Give us insight. Clarity to our eyesight, Lord. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Listen, this morning God wants to do work in your heart. Will you let Him do it? I don't care if you've been saved for a long time or you just got saved or maybe you're here and you're not saved. All you have to do is open up your heart to the Lord and say, Jesus, forgive me of doing life my way. Lord, I decide today to ask You to come into my life and be the Savior and be the Lord, be the leader, I will follow you. No matter where you're at on the pathway with Jesus, can you pray that prayer this morning? Jesus, we open our hearts to you and we ask you to come in. Be our shepherd, be our teacher, be our guide. Have your way. 
Make us true examples, Lord, of the body of Christ and uncover that which has been lost, God, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Let's all stand up together.